All right, we are on to our last speaker who has proudly claimed the mantle of rock star scientist, which I love. Beth Orcutt from Bigelow Laboratory of Ocean Science, uh, who has her PhD in marine sciences from the University of Georgia, as well as her BS in interdisciplinary studies. Um, and I just want to say this because I think it's really cool. Marine geochemistry emphasis with geology minor, which I think is really great. Beth is a senior research scientist at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Her research focuses on understanding microscopic life at and below the seafloor. <clears throat> Excuse me to resolve the importance of microbes in global chemical cycling while also revealing how life can survive in extremes for future astrobiology investigations. Beth has spent over 560 days at sea on 35 different field missions and is an expert in ocean exploration technology. Um, and when I asked Beth for her fun fact, she said when she was a girl, she was fascinated with the documentary about the discovery of the Titanic hosted by Telly Savalas, which is excellent. And then I found my own personal fun fact about Beth, which she doesn't know about. And her personal website is www.microbesareawesome.com. All right, thanks. And thanks for being here for the rest of the whole program. So I'm Beth. I'm at the Bigelow Laboratory, um, which is down in East Booth Bay. Uh, although I don't do any of my research here in the Gulf of Maine. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do way far away. And I like to start with thinking about the fact that our Earth is actually mostly a planet ocean. Um, and uh, way out here in places like the Pacific Ocean, we don't know a lot about what is happening underneath the surface of the water. Um, we have better maps of other planets than we have of our own seafloor. And so there's a lot down there that we don't know about, including the fact that you probably don't know that there's tens of thousands of mountains on the bottom of our seafloor. The largest mountains on Earth are actually starting um, under the ocean, larger than uh, Mount Everest. And so I'm interested in these places because these are areas where water is moving through the ocean crust. And this is really important because it's mining heat out of the earth and bringing that heat into the ocean um, and is helping regulate the temperature. Uh, and as that water moves through the seafloor, um, it gains heat. It also changes in chemistry. There's a lot of reactions going on between the water and the rocks. And you probably know the fact that water comes out of the seafloor because you maybe have seen scientific documentaries where you have these beautiful hydrothermal vents and all kinds of crazy animals. Um, but there are also spots where water comes out and it's not that hot. Um, and we don't really know a lot about those kinds of environments because they're not easy to find. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, so a lot of the research that I'm involved in is to go into these environments and really explore and understand what do these systems look like? What kind of animals live in these environments? Um, and what is the chemistry like? And so we'll go down in robots, um, or use robots, or we'll go down in submersibles to explore these environments to try to find out whether water is coming out. Um, we can add dyes and things like that to see the water coming out. And we see really interesting animal behaviors as well. One of these sites that I went to, we're like, why are all these octopus sitting upside down? What is going on? And we realized that they were actually the indicator of where the water was coming out of the seafloor because it was a little bit warmer. It's kind of like they're sitting in a spa. And that wasn't really a behavior that was really well understood. Um, and we wouldn't have known about it until we had gone to explore these places. Um, and so I'm really interested in what is living in these rocks um, and what kind of microbes are involved in various processes. And so we go to these sites. We ask the octopus to politely move. Um, so we can pick up the rocks, and I really want to know what microorganisms might be living on these rocks or inside these rocks that might be affecting the chemistry and changing these rocks, weathering these rocks. And this might sound weird, um, but it's not really. I mean, you've got rocks in your mouth, and they're covered in bacteria and biofilms, and that's why you brush your teeth, hopefully every day. Um, and so we're kind of using the same approach. We're going into these environments, and we're trying to get all those microbes off. And so when I say what, what, what microbe, what do I mean? Um, and it's essentially an operational definition. It's things that are so tiny that you need a microscope to see them. Oftentimes, they're from the uh, um, a domain of life called bacteria, but they can also be much more diverse than that. The genetic diversity of these microscopic organisms is massive. Um, they're way more different from each other than we are from, let's say, frogs or trees um, in terms of the genetic diversity that is there. But um, that's what I'm trying to look at. 
And so we'll go down to these environments. We'll sometimes deploy experiments where we take rocks of a known material and we'll polish them and make them look really, really yummy for a microbe to eat. And we'll put them on the seafloor. We'll let them sit there for a little while. Well, that's what they look like. And then we can bring them back and put them under the microscope and count up all the microbes. We can also, um, uh, earlier we were talking about DNA, so we can also extract the DNA or the RNA from these samples to try to figure out what genetic functions these microbes are involved in. And then other times, we don't want to just study what's happening at the sea floor. We want to go below the sea floor. And so I spent a lot of time on, my time on ships uh, drilling into the sea floor to collect rocks. Um, we go out with big international teams of scientists. This is one of the biggest international scientific programs out there um, to go and do this kind of research and really dig into these rocks and see how are microbes involved in weathering these rocks. Um, are they involved in, for instance, precipitating carbon and removing carbon out of these systems so that maybe it's a mechanism for trapping carbon dioxide? Um, these are the things that microbes can maybe help with, or they can maybe interfere with that process. And then sometimes we even do experiments uh, below the seafloor. There's a lot going on. It's very fun. And that's the end. <laughs> so obviously, these are affected by a lot of different things, temperature, the water around them, and that sort of thing. So when you take a sample, are you trying to maintain a temperature level? And I mean, you're going to have it in water. You're going to bring it up that way? Or are you just throwing it in a bag and grabbing them and bringing them up sort of thing? Yeah, great question. Um, so. Uh, if we were studying bigger animals, then we would have a lot of problems because those animals can't really withstand those temperature, really the pressure changes, the big one, that like, ugh, everything's cut off. Um, for the microbes, they're a little bit more fluid and plastic, and so they can kind of deal with the pressure changes much better. They grow slower, but they maybe don't die. Um, temperature is a bigger one. So if you're studying these hydrothermal systems that are really, really hot, um, to try to maintain that type of temperature, you have to have very specialized sampling devices. Not everybody has them, but you try to become friends with them and use them. Um, <clears throat> uh, what I try to do, and what I was um, mentioning at the very end, is we actually try to do our experiments on the seafloor and track what's happening in the environment so that we don't actually have to bring the samples back to the lab the whole time. So we design sensors uh, and data logging systems to put down there and track what goes on. Um, we maybe try to perturb the system and see how it responds. So that's how we try to get around it. Great question. Hi. Hi. Are there parts of the ocean that we can't access yet with robots that are just too deep for us to get to? Not anymore. Um, so the majority of the robots and submarines that scientists use uh, do have depth limits. Um, they can maybe go to about, let's say, three miles or so below the sea surface um, before they can't really operate anymore. That gets us to about 85% of our seafloor, so there's a lot that we can get to with most of the stuff that scientists have access to. Um, there are a few uh, um, robots now that can go to the deepest ocean trench depths. Um, uh, so we're, we can now get to everywhere that we want to. We just maybe can't do it with all the devices that we have. You, mentioned the, you mentioned the Titanic. Just this month, I read an article that they found the USS Lexington, which is a World War II aircraft carrier that went down in the Battle of the Coral Sea off of Australia. Did, is that more a question, it, it says it, you know, and it, it was discovered for the first time in 76 years. Is that more a question of just someone finally had the technology and the means to go get, to go find it, or did they literally discover it as in it was hard to find? I'm just trying to think in terms of that Malaysian airplane that went missing yeah. years ago, and so will they ever find that, rel relatively speaking? Really great question. So the technology exists to find those things. Uh, it's a matter of time. So uh, the, um, the multi-beam systems and uh, other imaging systems that a scientist, or in this case, Paul Allen, uh, used to go find these things, you have to spend a lot of time kind of mowing the lawn over the particular part of the seafloor to get the resolution to see something like that. So most of the um, ocean floor maps that we have have a resolution of, let's say, 100 meters per pixel. So you're not going to get a lot of detail. What they were doing, you're getting to like 
10 or so meters per pixel. So you can get, see that resolution. Um, so there's a big challenge going on right now. There's actually a, one of these Ocean X prizes to design new robots that can do these kinds of things faster so that we can get higher resolution maps of our ocean floor, because that's one of the biggest limitations to this. Hi. As someone who mostly dwells on the land, I, am, I always think of, oh, most of our energy is, is coming from the sun. That's obviously not the case. There's all of these vents that are... Um, it seems like the sole source of energy for, for these microbes and organisms around them. Do you have any idea of like how that compares to the power of the sun? Mm. Like, how much is it coming? Yeah. Um, although I like to think that what I do is the most exciting thing, um, there's way more energy from the sun to power life on Earth than there is from the ocean floor. Um, but if we think about other planets, uh, that's going to be a very different scenario. And so the chemistry will still be able to provide energy, but maybe their, uh, their star that these other planets are revolving around doesn't have as much solar energy. And also, um, if we think back in Earth's history about where life may have originated, um, uh, those are also things we think about in terms of how much chemical energy was available to support these organisms that can live independently of sunlight um, and you know, what would we find if we look elsewhere? We're back in time. Do we have more time? One more question? All right. Thanks. There you are. You want a bonus question? All right. Yeah. What you got? So for if you bring these microbes up to your lab, what, how could you prevent cross-contamination if they infected the person? Ooh, really fun question. Um, when we bring our samples to the lab, the, um, the microbes that are in those samples have never evolved in contact with humans. And so for them to have um, uh, properties that would infect us is a really, really small chance. Um, what we actually think about more is how do we prevent us, our DNA, from contaminating our sample so that we don't mix up the signal. Um, but in any case, when we collect these samples, we try to handle them very cleanly so that we're not touching them with our bare hands, we're always wearing gloves, we're putting them in, in hoods so that we're really trying to keep whatever was in the sample from getting everywhere else in our lab. Um, but we're um, generally not worried about becoming sick by exposure to them from the microbes. There's other things we might have to worry about, like um, a lot of these rocks have a lot of metals in them, like mercury or um, lead or things that we don't want to breathe in. So again, we try to be careful when we handle them. Thanks. Thanks so, much. so that concludes, this concludes the talking five second portion, sorry. Sharon's gonna put up a really quick picture that's gonna answer the question about solar energy versus the ocean's crust while I uh, tell you that uh, please stick around. We've got refreshments in the back. Uh, our scientists, I think, have all agreed to stick around. If you have a few more questions for them that we couldn't fit in, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, a quick reminder that we still have a giant amount of the festival going on for the rest of the weekend. Um, we'd love to have you join us at any one of those events. You won't make all of them, but um, that's because we scheduled them at the same times. Um, so, you got a Sharon or not? Okay. And the answer is? That is Acadia. <laughs> so. All right, we're going to put it up. You don't have to stick around. You can come check it out. But please get some refreshments, and we'll turn up the lights. Thank you very much. Thank you.